but it was not a hit put out against her because she was the paragon of paganism and she was going to spin things around against Christianity. It just, that wasn't quite how it worked. Hey everyone, Scott here. We're going to take a very short break for a word from our sponsors. I mean, to be fair, you might see some more stuff like that in later centuries, um, like the, fifth, uh, the sixth century when Justinian expels the um, philosophers of the school of Athens. They go over to Persia. Uh, but yeah, this is just a whole different thing when there's Christianity is still becoming an imperial religion and it's not maybe quite rooting out paganism the same way. But yeah, there was a ecclesial history I found where I think it's Socrates Scholasticus. He says something about that um, people all throughout the city admired her dignity and virtue and, and teaching ability and, and all these different things. Um, but yeah, it just, I, I guess that's just a story that it would be hard to portray in film of who would really care about, Hey, there was a riot over politics. I mean, then you're basically getting into star Wars episode one, the Phantom Menace, like boring political speeches and a fight that doesn't make any sense. So yeah, exactly. The story that they tell, they try to add in some little bits and pieces like the Christian mob attacked the Serapion and went in there and burned books. Then that's like the last destruction of the Library of Alexandria. But from what I understand, the Library of Alexandria was not what it was in the late uh before the BCE times that had been destroyed, I think, or in large a part of it had burned during Julius Caesar, part of it burned a little bit later. This, there was some destruction of it at this point, And there was even some destruction of it during Muslim Islam conquest times, a couple of hundred, a couple of hundred years after this point. So it wasn't like this is where the Library of Alexandria was basically the Library of Congress of the antiquity, and then it gets destroyed, and then we go into the Dark Ages. That's just not not how it happened. Yeah, from what I've heard, at least from Hypatia, that the place in the film that's depicted of being burned, um, that area is may have been a daughter library of the main one at one point, but a lot of the earlier accounts don't even mention books being destroyed. So in the kerfuffle, I'm sure some scrolls were burned, but um, the early accounts don't mention it. Like you said, the great library had undergone various levels of destruction. And one historian I read talked about, well, okay, what was actually lost with its destruction? Now, I'm sure any classicist would ab- would give anything to bring it back. We, I'm sure there's tons of gr- Greek plays and things like that that were lost in that. But the analogy they gave, it's sort of like if today the Library of Congress were burned down. Would we lose a lot of precious manuscripts that were unreplaceable? Yes. I mean, that would be a bad thing. But would there actually be any human knowledge that was lost by that? Well, no, because if it were some sort of a lot of knowledge and information or technology. It's not that it was really written down by a book. It might be, this is a functional guild that's supported by an empire. And that's why this technology is still here. So Roman concrete disappears, not because the recipe for it was lost, but the guild or the craftsmen who made it weren't connected to an empire that had enough money that could keep them going. So the knowledge gets lost, but it's not like we would be, you know, orbiting Pluto right now if the Library of Alexandria hadn't been burned down, I think is the idea here. I think that's the point you get to is that the Roman Empire had a lot of stagnation going on at that point. There were innovations that they could have followed up on that never were followed up on. I mean, they had batteries that worked in a theoretical sense. They had steam engines that worked in a theoretical sense. They weren't following up on these things. It's not like there was Hypatia in actuality invented anything. Well, she didn't invent anything because she was a philosopher, not an engineer. Also, it's something that the movie touched on, but never really, it never spoke about it directly was, there were a lot of slaves 
Hypatia had several slaves throughout the the movie that they they never address this fact that she has slaves. The the only thing is that her her main slave Davis the slave uh who is a fictional character, he breaks away and then I think in the end he's the one who ultimately kills her or what is one of the the leaders of it so he breaks away becomes a christian and then basically becomes uh Torquemada of the Spanish Inquisition when he, he was a slave he had some uh, legitimate gripes against Hypatia yeah slavery i can see that um have we mentioned yet how she's killed in the movie uh not exactly it's a pretty gruesome scene where she's um stripped and killed like on the high altar of the the cathedral the most important cathedral in alexandria okay yeah i mean that's something that i think before this movie came out there were different histories like edward gibbon or enlightenment histories that's the main point and there's um plenty of paintings of hypatia being killed and flayed so um, I'm sure there are pictures of that were found by many 14 year old boys in libraries, uh, throughout the different, uh, time periods in history. But, uh, yeah, so I think that's a story that kind of fits into this enlightenment narrative of the, the closing of this early enlightenment and the kind of how fragile civilization can be. Um, and also notice that it seems like the Christian mobs there, they have this sort of like Taliban ISIS look to them as well. Well, yeah, that was something that um, they were even criticized by by Coptic people was that they made them out to be just monsters dressed in black, just killing people willy nilly. It, it really was. It was reminiscent more of, I mean, even the Spanish Inquisition isn't exactly what uh, popular culture brings it out to be, but it's very much in a very different time frame sense of things that just it just didn't exist then so many of the elements that they bring up in this movie just didn't didn't exist and just weren't relevant to the early 400s well i guess um well you're gonna (laughs) You're going to talk about uh, why you hated it, which is it's kind of it's hard to separate that in its own section because that's been so blended in. Um, I, I guess I'll try to say a couple positive things because I am the defender, so I'll you know do my defense in the Nuremberg trial here. Um, okay, so the design um, it does sort of try to mix in elements with um, like Egyptian elements with Roman and Hellenic, and that's kind of cool because. Like, I mean, part of imperial architecture is an imperial architect could design a building from Rome or in Byzantine times from Constantinople or in Ottoman times, Istanbul. But in the provinces, you might have the structure plan sent from the center, but then you would do the design and the ornamentation locally. So there's a little mismatch that the movie kind of does. The costumes don't really reflect that because they all have that generic first century Rome look that you see in Gladiator or passion of the Christ or whatever place in Hollywood where there's all like the, the storage facility of Rome costumes. It's these generic togas and tunics and stuff like that. And, um, this is a little bit nitpicky, but Hey, history nerds here. We'll just go for it. That, I mean, it seems like you're always going to have the same soldier garb. They have the gladius sword. They have the, um, segmented leather for armor by the fifth century here. We're getting into, they're almost starting to look kind of medieval um, with more metal use. So, but I don't expect that's probably expecting too much. Um, what else can I say? It's good. I think the movie kind of mentions that the it's, they sort of say something that this library was part of the great library. So they at least understand that aspect of it. Um, the interpretation gets a little bit silly where Hypatia rebuffed potential suitors uh, or the prefect because I mean for her as a neoplatonist that would have been her reasons in the movie it's more like she's a career academic married to her job so the facts yeah. would have been right but then the interpretation is is what's silly so that is my very very flimsy flaccid defense of the movie um, anything else I can think of um, no what I would defend go for it in the movie I would defend that it it is visually appealing. It captures 
an interesting setting. I mean, Egypt in late antiquity is something that isn't very well covered in movies. You don't see that every day. I think it it touched upon a lot of interesting ideas that it just never followed up on, like the interactions between Jews and Christians. That's That was fascinating. The Jews were expelled from Egypt during the reign of Cyril of Alexandria. There's a lot of interesting things that they could have gotten into here. Orestes and how his real relationship was with Hypatia. I mean, you get into it that it does it just become a political movie, that there's nothing, uh, it's a polit- political pot boiler that takes place in f- fifth century Egypt is not the most <laughs> exciting movie. But I think they had something to work with there that they just, it was never in the filmmaker's idea to follow through some of the more interesting themes that I think could have been really fun. Yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah, there's so much to unpack here. So any other things that you think are just, you think, uh, this movie that you really hated. I, I hated the fact that they didn't, that they treated the cops. The cops today are a people who have a pretty rough time of it. There's, it's not easy to be a cop in Egypt today. And you're just going to run them through the mud. Like, I mean, what other group would we look at and not try and get, at least throw them a bone? I, th- I don't like how they played lightly with the slavery aspect of it. Like the, like Dava should have been happy to be a slave to Hypatia. Mm-hmm. And I also, I just felt like the, this whole idea of the radical science hating Christians and they've had enough with this, uh, woman Hypatia and they kill her right in the middle of the church on the altar and science loses one of its greatest figures and then the world's over and we're in the dark ages. Like that's just not, it's not accurate for one, but it, it, I think, if you're watching, if you're a kid, I doubt any, um, many teenagers would watch this movie, but to leave a, somebody who's maybe just learning about the history of this era with such a bad, inaccurate view of what the time period was, they're going to either go and research more and say, like, none of this is true, or they're going to research it and be com- completely uninterested in it. There's not, this doesn't open the door for further research or further education. The entertainment doesn't lead to education. It was just preachy. It was basically a sermon of Alejandro Amenabar's beliefs on modernity and modernity, including the early modern age of Galileo and Copernicus. Yeah, it's that thing where um, this kind of idea of where civilization is knocked down and it's this um, religion versus science. I mean, that that the idea has been around since the Enlightenment. I think it was definitely repopularized by Carl Sagan with his book Cosmos, his TV show in the 80s. And I think he had the idea when he's writing and doing television uh, during the Cold War when there's a fear of nuclear destruction. And the idea is, well, civilization can be fragile. Look what has happened in the past. Look what happened with Hypatia, the fall of Greece, the fall of Rome. Galileo is another person who, um, with the controversy, he shook up the cosmological model of the church. So that's why he was persecuted. So we can't return to the same dogmatic understanding. And I think what we've done on our own respective podcasts is um, definitely not saying that religious figures don't have their, they've gotten their hands dirty many times, but the the delineation between religion and science is a modern one that people just wouldn't have made in the past. Um, whether you were a pagan, whether you were a Platonist, whether you were a Christian, there just wasn't the mental framework to make that different type of delineation. And yeah, I mean, I think with this, um, there, there's a, there's definitely a good movie to be made with the story of Hypatia because she's a fascinating figure. No question about it. She, she did something that, people typically don't do. So she was a, a, 
a universally beloved leading academic in a very intellectual city who is a woman. 